Oh, yes. What a time and season we are in. Everyone say, I'm in a divine season right now. Let me explain a couple things. If I can explain a couple things. It's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit. And one of the things that is vitally important because so many people miss what God is trying to do. Miss opportunities, miss so many things. And God doesn't give up on us. Never. He never quits. Even a week quit. He never quits. And in, in, in this time, there are areas where God brings you through what we call seasons. And there are divine seasons, and there are carnal seasons. So the carnal season is something that you bring yourself into and not allow God to transition you into his season. In Genesis chapter 1, if you'll go there for a moment, Oh, hallelujah. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. This is such a profound scripture. It says, in the what? Beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. So the first thing that God created was time. In this time... The Lord said, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. That is called a universal season. It's universal. It's universe. God pulled a chunk out of eternity and set a season because a season is time with a beginning and an end. Is everybody with me? Now we have sub-seasons. Amen. So in this big season of the beginning and end, the Lord said that everything's going to burn and, and so forth. You know, when it's done, the earth will go and all the universe and all the stars will burn up. And we'll enter, that will be the end of the universal season and we'll enter eternity. Because the season is associated with time. So God created time. That was the first thing he created. What it's... Predestined. Time is predestined. It's a God created a time and a predestined designated to fulfill his purpose. So that there's a beginning and an end of this predesignated time that he set forth. And in this predesignated period uh, or predestined, let me say this again. It's a predestined period designated to fulfill his purpose. Is everybody with me? A predestined, a predestined a period of designated uh, to fulfill his purpose. It's a beginning and end. It's called time. What is, actually, time is a communicating device. It's a communicating device used in a dimensional existence. To pinpoint events of purpose and destiny. I'm going to say that again. Time. Is a communication device. Used in a dimensional existence. To pinpoint. Events of purpose. And destiny. Is everybody with me? So God uses it as a communication device. Amen? It is universally understood. God uses seasons, feasts, moons, planets, stars, and events of weather to express his time of purpose. And he is the holder of all universal time and time change. He, because he is the holder of the universal time and time change, it is, he has the ability to interrupt time in a global, national, or per personal purpose for someone's life. Because he is God, 
And he's the one who created time for his purpose. Is everybody with me? Praise God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Is everybody there? It's right after Proverbs. Ecclesiastics chapter 3. In verse 1, powerful verse, just like Genesis 1. He said, to everything there is a what? A season. A time for every purpose under heaven. So, this is powerful. Seasons is an accumulating events characterized by appointed times. Has everybody got it? Is everybody with me? Everybody okay? So, what is this season? It's accumulating events characterized by appointed times of change to fulfill purpose and destiny, spiritually and physically. You'll have to catch this. Verse 1, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, a time to sow, and a time to keep silent, a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, and a time of war, and a time of peace. So again, a season is an accumulating event characterized by appointed times of change to fulfill purpose and destiny spiritually and physically. Now, let me give you an example of what's happening we know that there are physical seasons, summer, winter, fall, you know, spring. And, and every time we get ready to go into a season weather-wise, there is a change. But what happens before that season comes or just beginning in that season, we begin to put away summer clothes. We begin to pull out more warmer clothes. We begin to no longer go to the beach. <laughs> Because it begins to get too cold. We know, there are certain things that change in that season or God prepares you to change in that season. See, we prepare ourselves for that seasonal change of weather. But God prepares you for a divine season. And what happens is if you do not cooperate with that in the transition of the next season he has prepared for you, it can become very fatal. It's like going in the wrong direction and hitting a dead end. <laughs> when God alters or changes a season, it's called a dimensional shift, or what we call holy shift. Because it takes you by surprise. But we're to be ready in that. What he does is he's trying to get us on a divine, into a divine season. When he sees a strain from that, he interrupts to try and cause a change or a change of course, a navigational change. But so many times people miss it. And Daniel 9. You know, the word says something. I was afflicted when I went astray. How many of you know sickness can be an affliction? How many of you know accidents can be an affliction? How many of you all know losing your job can be an affliction? Anything to that arena. Well, afflictions are what God tries, uses. He doesn't bring the affliction. Amen. But the affliction will... God uses to bring us back on course. 
It's a course change. Because he's trying to bring us into the next divine season for me and you. In Daniel chapter 9, in verse 20, Hallelujah, where are you, Daniel? Daniel 9 and verse 20. Now, here's Daniel. While I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the, the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me, and he said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring everlasting righteous, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy, the most holy. Now, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall and even in troublesome times. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. In other words, he will die on the cross for me and you. Amen. And the people of the prince who is to come, which is the prince of power of error, or what we call the prince of darkness, the people and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, which is seven years. That is called the seven-year tribulation. And that it, there are actually two seasons in the seven-year tribulation. Each season will be three and a half years. Is everybody okay? Why? Because that one will be called tribulation and the other will be called great tribulation, which is God wrath. Those are two different seasons. One's a beginning and an end. One's a beginning and an end. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, the prince shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering on the wing, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. In other words, he will break covenant. He will cause the covenant to be broke. So everybody got it. The prince is Satan. He's the prince of darkness. One week is the seven-year tribulation. There'll be two seasons, three and a half years of tribulation and three and a half years of great tribulation. These are seasons. I'm using these as an example. And Matthew 24. Now, we know that this season is for Israel also because tribulation will be uh, associated with Israel and the Jews. In Matthew 24, and verse 3. Matthew 24 and verse 3. Now, as Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when all these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and in the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, that's ethnic group, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, and floods, and fires, and all kinds of things. In various places, which we see now. All these are the beginning of sorrows. This is also another season. Somebody got it? These are seasons. And in these seasons, this is a divine season. Beginning of sorrows is a season. Tribulation and great tribulation. Let's go a little bit further. 
It says in verse 9, then they will deliver you up to what? Tribulation, which is another season. And kill you, and you will be hated by all nations and for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And we've seen that now. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet, which we just talked about, which will be the breaking of the seven-year treaty in the middle of tribulation. Uh, standing in the holy place, then let those who are in, in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in, um, on the house stop not go down and take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be what? Great tribulation such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever be. So we see that these are seasons. These are divine seasons that God has brought forth. The beginning of sorrows is a season. Tribulation is a season. Great tribulation is a season. We see that there'll be false prophets, false teachers. They will try to alter or distract individuals from God's prophetic seasons and misalign them. Does everybody got it? He's going to try to misalign them to miss the release of the promise for each season. God has specific promises and purposes for each season, individually and globally. Is everybody okay? Remember, God's time is God's will. Not being in a line with his time is dangerous. Why? Because then you're not in a line and you miss the season. Afflicted sufferings because of loss of protection. Is everybody okay? That's why since September 23rd, we have entered a season. It's known as the Messiah season. Why? Because there's never been in history a reality of the Messiah's return. Never. This is the greatest reality that people are looking for the Messiah's return. Why? Because of all the events and everything that is happening because we are coming now to the end of the beginning of sorrow season. And we will enter tribulation season. Is everybody okay? So right now it's called the Messiah season. Why? Because it is a divine season where people are looking to the future. And the Messiah's return. And John chapter 1. Hallelujah. In verse 6, John chapter 1 and verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We were born of the light. In other words, faster than sound. Somebody got it. We were born of a light that's faster than sound. We are carriers of light. And because we are carriers of light, <laughs> God brings counsel in us all the time. 
And because of this, we are carriers of light. God corrects you to his universal time and his purpose of his will for you. Because you are a light in you. It connects you. Unless the enemy can disconnect you. Universal time and will that changes the course of life. This is in me and you. And it brings the eternal purpose in a time-related realm. This is called will. We are God doing God's will. Now, in the time-related realm, he affirms it with divine seasons all the time. He brings us into a transition, but he always prepares you for the transition. If you try to prepare yourself, you can't go in. You must cooperate with his tr changing you. Does everybody go out? Got this. You cannot prepare yourself. He prepares you for the transition for the next season. All the time. That's where many people are fulfilling their own destiny instead of the predestined one that has been prepared for them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 17... Confirming the word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Many fall out of alignment. Many. And when they fall out of alignment, the protection begins to lift and the enemy comes to attack because he knows you have enough truth in to damage him. And he's now out to kill you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, things, all things have become what? New. A new creation according to God's time and seasons with a Desire willing to cooperate and change in seasonal shifts. We are living from the future, not from the past. Has everybody got it? We live from the future to the present, not from the past to the present. If you are living from the past to the present, then you're out of a line. And you cannot enter the new season, the divine season. It's impossible. You can do all you can. You can cry to God. You can do everything. But he says, he, he, if you have not been prepared in the transition by him, you cannot enter the next season, which is the divine season by him. You cannot enter it. Why? Because if, he is, if you've not completed, if you've not allowed him to complete you in the past season, he will not send you into the next. You will repeat that season and stay there until you've allowed him to complete what he had to in you so you can transition to the next season. Does everybody understand that? Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 4. You know, so many people are still trying to fix their past. Keeps them living from the past to the present. Their hope is still in the things of the past. Not in the future. So if your hope is really not in the future, then how can you enter a next season? Amen? Amen? Because the person is still caught up in the past. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. And in the what? Process of time. Okay. So in the process of time, that means that 
in certain things that happen in this time span where there's a beginning and end, it's a season. Amen. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit to the, of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and, he's, and his offerings, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Something powerful, he says to him. He says, if you, if you do well, in other words, if you are willing to change, everybody got it. See, if you're not willing to change, you cannot enter the next season. If you are willing to change, will you not be accepted? Does everybody get this? And if you will... <laughs> And if you do not, and if you do not do well, what happens? Sin lies at the door. And it's desirous for you, but you should rule over it. Why? Because you should have a desire to change. Again, God was asking Cain to allow, to cooperate with a change so he can Prepare him for a transitional shift into the next season. Now, verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Obviously, he wasn't willing to change. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Did he lie? Yeah. That's still the old, isn't it? Am I my brother's keeper? Surprised God didn't strike him dead then. <laughs> and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. You will till the ground. It shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and vagabond you shall be on the earth. What a bummer. Why? Because he refused to accept the change. Why? God was trying to get him into make a, a transitional, do the transition from one season to another. God was trying to end his season if he cooperated with him so that he could enter the divine season. But he chose to stay the same and his season turned carnal, turned corruption. He became what? A fugitive. The refusal to make the change and unwilling to recognize the divine season of opportunity resulted in disaster and separation. In Genesis 16. The refusal to change and unwilling to recognize the divine season of opportunity resulted in disaster and separation. In Genesis 16 and verse 1. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, Abram, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain child by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah, his wife. Now, I want you to know that prior to this, <clears throat> God, the Lord had appeared and spoke to him and shared with him that he would have a son from Sarah. Amen. And um, Sarah kind of laughed, thinking, man, I'm gonna, I'm, by the time this happens, I'm going to be too old. And so what happened is because Sarah lost vision, lost sight of the promise of God, thinking God had abandoned her and rejected her, convinced her husband to go into the maid and produce a child. Now, verse 3. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, 
and gave her to her husband Abram to his wife. And after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, so she went into so he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. And Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. Nice. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarah, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarah dwelt, dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for a multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and your son, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be what? A wild man. His hand shall be against every man. Sounds like a terrorist. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Does everybody see this? Why? Because something was birthed out of season. And that's what the enemy wants to do. When we fall out of the will of God in this time, we bring ourselves into a season and it produces an Ishmael. And an Ishmael is not the promised seed. It is a rebellious seed. Look at what happened from Ishmael. Now you got Islam and all the other Arab uh, anti-Jew nations that are against them, all from that lineage. Is everybody okay? Ishmael, instead of Isaac, was a promise seed, not willing to prepare for the divine season um, to push in other words, he was pushed, she was, Sarah was pushed by the enemy and produced an Ishmael. Don't allow the enemy to push you. Change is more beneficial when we synchronize our efforts and align ourselves with current purpose of God on earth. Amen? By knowing when a season is over and a new one is beginning, which will embrace your new opportunities. So many times people don't even realize that their season has come to an end and they stay in it. Is everybody okay? When God is making that transition for that individual, that individual refuses to go in the next season too comfortable in the old. Not willing to transition. Success of our destiny lies on our ability to change. Success of our destiny lies on our ability to change and recognize the season of change. Those that are most responsive to the change become successful. It's not about intellect. Amen? It's not about how religious you are or how much knowledge you know. It's about your relationship. We must break, as everybody grab hold of this, we must break out of our momentary glories and transition through the veil of tomorrow. When we make this shift for tomorrow, when we're willing to cooperate with it, amen, what begins to happen? Opportunities? All right, now grab hold of this. When we make this shift, tomorrow's opportunities will become today's realities. I'm going to say it again. 
when we are willing to make the ship shift and cooperate with it, tomorrow's opportunities will become today's reality. Why? Because you are now entering that season. Because our vision is fixed in the future, not the present. We are maintaining a position for the next shift into the divine season. Only God establishes the divine season. There are loads of opportunities. There's blessings. There's freedom. There's deliverance. There's healings. There's all kinds of things that God has for us. Every season has specific promises to be released. It's a part of growth and maturing. And 2 Corinthians chapter 3. what's happening but you're doing things because you're being led by the spirit and there's such a peace there and and it's an area to where you, it doesn't matter because you know god's in control it doesn't matter you know all things are going to work to the good no matter what it doesn't matter and in every season that you enter you become more trustworthy more of a better steward. God begins to release more things to you. You're earning his trust. Because you, if you can't trust him, he can't trust you. Amen? He desires to bring us into the divine season and remove us from the old. But again, too many people are caught up on their momentary glories. And not willing to step through that veil for the next event. They're still celebrating their momentary glories. Because they're really not living from the future to the present. They're living from the past to the present. Amen? Oh, glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Divine seasons. Again, we are in one right now. A uh, uh, universal, what we call a global divine season. Now we know that the feasts of the Lord are divine seasons. Amen? Each one represents a time sequence, appointed time by God. That is the divine season. Each feast represents, just because you celebrate the feast, doesn't mean it's only when Jesus fulfills that feast. Amen? Why? Because there's a beginning of the celebration, then there's an ending of the fulfillment. Everybody got it. So we recognize the feast, but only Jesus could fulfill it because he's the beginning and the end. He is the one who is the universal time holder. He's the one that sets up the divine feast for each and every individual person. Every country has certain seasons. Iraq has a season right now. It's coming through. Certain seasons. Some will stay the same. Some will end up in destruction. That's why those who are with Israel will prosper. Those who are against Israel will be destroyed. Why? Because they're not willing to transition into the next season that God has. Oh, hallelujah. We could go on forever on this stuff. In verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Let's speak it. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was what? Passing away. It was a season. But their minds were blinded for until now, this, till this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away where? So they refused to go into the divine season. That's why Jesus came, right? to set up a divine season. Some of them are still bound because they refused to step into that season. So they're still blinded to it. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, Beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from what? Glory to glory or from what? Season to season. Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, we need an awareness 
of the time we are living in and positionally set for the next step of our destiny because your destiny relies on your season you step into. Has everybody got it? That is your destiny. That is a predestined destiny. God has specific seasons set prepared for me and you. It's already predestined. But you know that the enemy will try to interfere in any way he can. In John 21. Is everybody okay? John chapter 21. You know how many people refuse to cooperate with the transition to the next divi uh, divine season and they're still in their old season? In verse 1, John 21 and verse 1. Let's speak it. After these things, Jesus showed himself again. This is, of course, after he rose from the dead to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find food. So they cast, and now they were not, so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Now remember, they were, Accustomed to casting it on the other side. But Jesus asked them, would you be willing to change? And he, they cast it on the right side. Therefore, the disciples whom Jesus loved said, and now look at, and there, and there was so much, so much fish, they couldn't even drag it in. Therefore, that disciple whom loved Jesus said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter had heard that, it was the Lord he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for there were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Because they were willing to change, they had just entered a whole nother season. And that season is always a release of prosperity. Has everybody got it? Willing to to change course. Think about how many times we refuse to change course. Or fear prevented us from changing course. Amen? Not trusting God. In Philippians 3. That's so where the word says, be anxious for what? Nothing. But everything in prayer and supplication. And the peace of God will guide your hearts and your minds. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Not that I've already attained or am I already perfected, but I do what? I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, what? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are what? Ahead. You know, one of the things that the Lord always shares with me, when there's something going on, and there's a request or there's a communication, He'll always say, show me. Show me. In other words, he wants, to, wants me to be aware 
of what is happening. And he wants each and every one of us to be aware of what's going on. Aware of what? Transitional changes, things that are around us. Something he wants us to be aware of, a job change, whatever it is. And, and he'll say, show me you're willing to do whatever it takes. <clears throat> show me. What he's trying to do is get us to be aware all the time so that we are tentative and sensitive to his voice. And there's that cry again, Lord, show me. What's he, show me, Lord, what you want me to do. And one of his responses sometimes, show me you're faithful. See, there's always a, an area where you must, to reap, you must sow. That never stops. God wants us to be detailed. He wants us to see the things that he sees. He wants us to be ready in season and out. Amen? Being in season and out means your own. Why? He wants you to be ready for the transition of to that next divine season. Being ready in season and out means get out of it. Be ready to jump to the divine season. Because so many times we get caught and stay in our own season and have to complete what he wanted us to complete in that season so we can go to the next one. So he says here, I press, verse 14, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on what? Earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lonely body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working of by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. So we press on into the divine season of opportunity where all things will work to the good. Amen? Remember something. This is a constant thing where we are in motion. We are moving. Amen? We're seeking. We're moving. We're decreeing. We're quoting. We're serving. In other words, if, if you think about this, remember a ship's rudder gives direction when the ship is moving or in motion. Amen? But when it's setting in port, it doesn't, give, it doesn't mean a poop. Amen? So you and I must be willing to learn, trust, and follow in everything that we do. Why? Because he's trying to bring us to the next season. And I'm going to close at Hebrews 4. Are you cooperating in the transition to the divine season. And so you, we have a tendency to try to carry into the season what he was using in the old season. And he's saying, look, that's not going to allow you to stay there. One thing we don't want to contaminate is the new season. Because that new season, when it gets contaminated, becomes the old season. Amen? And even though you, you transitioned into the, the new season, we decided to bring the old with you. And when that contamination comes, it just that new season becomes an old season again, and he cannot release the promises except for what's in the old season. Is everybody okay? See, we're, the word says something specific. After you complete the will of God, which is a season, he releases the promises. After you complete the will of God, he releases the promises. So you must cooperate with that season and allow him to transition you for that new season, which is a divine season, and not take the stuff from the old into the new. That's why it says you're a new creation. Old things are what? Passed away and all things are what? Becoming new. We have this tendency to bring the old into the new and it contaminates. What does the word say about wine? 
the new wine skin. I mean, you know, you cannot put new wine into a what? An old wine skin. It will happen. It will rip. It will tear apart. So this is where God is trying to get us. But we won't recognize these things if we're not living from the future to the present. We are always future bound. <clears throat> we're always thinking about future. That's called kingdom living. <clears throat> Hebrews 4 and verse 1. Let's speak it. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have some short of it. Come short of it. For indeed the gospel is preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being fixed with mixed with what? Faith in those who heard it. So there was why? Listen. Faith is connection. In other words, it wasn't mixed with faith. Why? Because they're not living from the pre, from the future to the present. So many times people are still looking for moments of glory instead of eternal glory. It's a totally different thing. Verse 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest. We who have followed. That's why he says deny yourself, pick up the cross, and what? Follow. That's motion, isn't it? That's movement. For we who have believed do, do not enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in a way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of what? Disobedience. disobedience or disqualification or they were not aligning themselves. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David, today after such a long time as it has been said, today if you will what? Hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken to another of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we... Do not have, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Divine seasons. We are in a divine season season of God's global divine season. Why? Because it is a season we call the Messiah since September 23rd where the birthing was. Amen? One thing we don't want to do is not, not misalign ourselves. So we got to keep our focus. Look, at there's a tendency right now of a return of the Lord. Why? We're watching and sensitive to all the things that are going on in the world. We know that these seasons like the beginning of sorrows is ending. It's coming to a close. Tribulation is next. We know that they're working on a seven-year treaty. We know this. It's happening right now. So we know that we're getting ready to enter tribulation. And then there'll be great tribulation. We are that close. But God has personal seasons for you. Your own divine season. So you must allow him to transition you to that next season by cooperation. And, of course, the formula is deny yourself, pick up the cross, and what? 
follower. We must learn, trust, and follow. It must be God's time, not our time. It must be God's will, not our will. We must allow him to fulfill the predestined time and seasons for me and you and not our own. Amen? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your mercies and grace, and we are expecting in this next divine season that you have prepared us to enter the opening doors, the opening doors of blessings, the open doors of revelation and illumination, the opening doors of visitations, the opening doors of dreams and visions, and the opening doors of more of you. We are honored and blessed. Thank you for your word. Let it be imparted. Let it grow and bear fruit for your glory. And let it penetrate every part of our being and every part of our dimensional arena in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Be blessed and stay dressed with the glory. Amen.